Hello, I hope you're having a great day. Welcome back to another episode of Introductory Organic Chemistry. And today we're going to start our series on SN2 reactions, specifically with nitrogen and sulfur nucleophiles. So before we get into that, let's look at some of the practice problems I assigned last lecture. First, I asked you to demonstrate a synthesis of this iodide from this alcohol. Now your first two options would be to do an apple reaction. Now you could use triphenylphosphine and either end iodosuccinamide, or alternatively you could use carbon tetraiodide. Now an alternative option would be a multi-step approach. So the multi-step would be first you use thionyl bromide, convert this alcohol into an alkyl bromide, then treat that alkyl bromide with sodium iodide. Now you might be wondering why we've, mo why we've moved to a secondary alcohol and a secondary iodide when we've been talking mostly about primary alcohols and primary iodides. And I just wanted to put in an example that demonstrate that this approach also works on secondary alcohols most of the time. Now this approach would not work for tertiary uh, iodides or bromides and so this is like a little bit more challenging. And we're going to talk about that when we get more into SN1 reactions. The second problem that I assigned was to demonstrate the conversion of this into some product, whether the mesylate or the chloride reacts, you have to determine that. And so we have two positions. We have a primary position and we have a secondary position. Now, as a rule of thumb for steric reasons, primary alcohols or primary positions tend to be more reactive than secondary positions. And so if these were both chlorides, we would expect the primary position to react first. Now, the additional factor is we have a mesylate, and so mesylates are more reactive than chlorides. So we would expect the mesylate to be substituted first. Now, if we have a ton of sodium iodide and we leave this reaction long enough, probably both of these would eventually react. But under normal conditions where we're monitoring the reaction, we should be able to stop at this product. So before we get into the main material, I wanted to introduce a few more reagents. The first one is Bach anhydride. Uh, the technical name of this is diterbutyl dicarbonate. This group is, uh, this functional group is used to protect amines. So if you have amines that are reacting and you want to make them not reactive, you can put a Bach group on, an n Bach. So the Bach would include one of the carbonyls and the tert-butoxy group. Now the other useful thing that this does is it makes the molecule more polar, sim similar to how um, TBS chloride makes alcohols uh, less polar, this makes amines less polar. So it has two benefits, adding solubility in organic solvents and protecting the nitrogen. Next we have this funky looking iodine 5 compound. This is called DMP. DMP has become a popular method for synthesizing aldehydes and occasionally ketones in recent years. And the reason for this is basically you just dump in your alcohol with DMP in a common solvent and essentially the only byproducts are acetic acid and then uh, degraded products derived from DMP. So it's a nice reaction. It's very mild, very selective. Uh, another reagent that you see quite often is Tempo. This is a persistent radical compound. Oftentimes if chemists are generating radical species in their developed methods to prove the formation of a radical intermediate, they will dump in Tempo into the reaction and the Tempo will react with their radical and produce uh, a probed product. And so this is a radical probe. Occasionally, these can be used synthetically for other purposes, but for the most part, it's just used as a radical probe. The reason that it's stable is there's these big bulky groups preventing any reactivity uh, adjacent to this nitrogen. But radical reactions are a topic that we're going to discuss at a later date. So today, we're going to be talking about SN2 reactions of nitrogen and sulfur. So if you'll recall, most of the time when you're choosing a leaving group, you want to use something between a bromide, iodide, or sulfonate. So occasionally we can use chlorides if we have a really good nucleophile or uh, we are able to for one reason or another, such as like in the case of benzylic, allylic, or propargylic chlorides. But for the most part, you just will use like bromides, iodides, and sulfonates. So if you want to do an SN2 reaction, there's some important things to consider for your nucleophiles. So the first thing is that your nucleophile is relatively nucleophilic. It has a high nucleophilicity. Generally, I would say like above 10 or so, but it obviously depends on what your electrophile is, which is why I, uh, most of the time you don't see bold statements about relative, the absolute nucleophilicity made. Um, so something like thalamide is a much better nucleophile than ammonia by like several orders of magnitude, I think five orders of magnitude. 
Um, the additional consideration is you want your nucleophile to have relatively low basicity under the reaction conditions. So uh, if you have a very strong base, such as an alkoxide, they're going to try and do other chemistry on your molecule because they're more interested in getting protons than they are reacting with electrophiles. Uh, a base is essentially just a nucleophile towards protons, right? So it's essentially the affinity that it has to protons versus to electrophiles. So as I was saying, alkoxides tend to be poor nucleophiles because they do other chemistry first most of the time. Um, effectively, what this means is it's hard to make ethers. Now, the exception would be with phenols because phenoxides are relatively weak bases still, and so and they're relatively good nucleophiles, so you're able to form um, aryl alkyl ethers fairly easily. So we'll start with nitrogen nucleophiles. So the problem with using ammonia as a nucleophile, even though it's relatively nucleophilic compared to water by about five orders of magnitude, um, you'll generate mixtures of products. And the reason for this is the product of the reaction can be deprotonated. So let's imagine the reaction of ammonia with benzyl chloride. Ammonia has an end parameter of about 11.4. Okay, great, we form our product. Now, uh, what can happen though is because we have an excess of ammonia is this can be deprotonated in situ. Losing ammonium, you generate benzylamine. Now, if you compare benzylamine to ammonia, it's about three, uh, three orders of magnitude stronger. So this is a thousand times more reactive. Now, even if you'd use like 100 equivalents of ammonia as your base, this is still a thousand times more reactive. So this would still have a tenfold higher reactivity rate than your ammonia. So what this will mean is you'll start getting dibenzylamine, tribenzylamine, tetrabenzylammonium, and generally as the amine gets more and more substituted, they tend to get more reactive. So once this happens, it'll be even easier to get to the third one and so on and so on. And so it's not a great strategy to employ just ammonia uh, to an alkyl halide. Um, however, for industrial processes, they're able to fine tune these reactions into getting exactly what they want most of the time, or they just purify out what they care about. Now, the solution to this is to use a masked amine, something that will only react once. And so thalamide tends to be the nucleophile that we employ for this purpose. If you want to get secondary or tertiary amines, we usually use reductive amination, but that's not going to be something that we discuss for several videos still. So here we have thalamide. Thalified, thalamide approaches as the nucleophile, displacing chloride as the nucleophage. Thalamide has a relatively high nucleophilicity of 15.5. This forms benzyl thalamide as the product. When we want to unmask our amine that we just formed, this carbon nitrogen bond was the one we wanted to form. We treat it with hydrazine. Hydrazine is also relatively nucleophilic, but in this case, it will attack at the carbonyls, forming this byproduct as well as our benzylamine. So thalamide is a good nucleophile. This reaction will work really well, and it's easy to unmask. The only disadvantage is we have to use hydrazine, which is relatively toxic. So the functionalization of other nitrogen heterocycles and so on is possible using relatively mild conditions. So even though indole isn't that acidic at the NH, it's possible to use a mild base like potassium carbonate in DMF with an alkylating agent. And this is typically an overnight reaction, which is why it says 18 hours. You can even use dihalides for these reactions and you'll get relatively good yields of the mono functionalized product. You might see trace amounts of the di functionalized, but if we were to do this with like normal amines, like all hell would break loose. It would be very, very messy. So these are softer nucleophiles. They tend to be well behaved. Um, the other thing to think about is if you're a synthetic chemist trying to do method development, this is like a really useful method for preparing functionalized building blocks. Now you have a big funky heterocycle on one end and a leaving group on the other. So you can put two different things on, and this is a great way to develop libraries of compounds. Now we're gonna to move towards sulfur nucleophiles. So while alkoxides tend to be too basic to prepare ethers, thiolates are awesome, super nucleophilic, not that basic. So we can take an alkyl bromide in the presence of uh, sodium methane thiolate, this will just displace the bromide, affording the thioether as a product. If we wanted to prepare a thiol instead of a thioether, you might think, could we use sodium hydrogen sulfide or sodium sulfide? But the problem is we can do multiple alkylation events. And so this could displace one iodide, but then it could go and displace another, and so you'll get a mixture. So 
this is kind of like the amine problem that we had earlier. Now, like the thalamide strategy, if we just use a different masked sulfur nucleophile, in this case thiourea, the sulfur can attack, displace the iodide, and then we can hydrolyze off that um, as a urea byproduct. Treating with acid affords the thiol. So this is a nice selective way to do this. Thiourea is also a really nucleophilic sulfur source, so this reaction works relatively well. You can also isolate these salts most of the time because they're uh, positively charged. So if you do this in a, a polar aprotic solvent, this will usually precipitate out. Um, now I wanted to briefly mention the preparation of sulfones and sulfinates. So this is an underutilized method that works extremely well. Sulfonates are really, really nucleophilic, and a lot of the time when people prepare sulfones, they'll do what we showed earlier and just make the thioether and then add an oxidant in to oxidize this all the way up to the sulfone, and that always creates problems because it's finicky. So if you use sulfonates in ethanol or water, some sort of protic solvent system, you'll generally get like 98 or 99 percent sulfone with very very negligible amounts of the sulfonate. However if you do this reaction in DMF or another polar aprotic solvent like DMSO you'll tend to get the sulfonate ester as the byproduct or as the major product um, with minor amounts of the sulfone forming. Um, now in my case I've had a paper where I had prepared a derivative which I thought was the sulfone and right before we published I was analyzing the NMR spectrum. NMR is a technique that we use to look at the chemical environment of protons, carbons, and fluorines, for example. And I noticed that some of the protons looked a little bit funky. And if you recall from an earlier lecture where we talked about sulfoxides being chiral, here a sulfonate is like a sulfoxide. So there's a lone pair on one side, the oxygen on the other. And so those two protons look different. And I was really confused because for a sulfone, they should be chemically equivalent. They should be identical protons. Um, but fortunately, prior to publication, I realized that one of our examples wasn't a sulfone, it was actually a sulfonate ester. So it's important to understand what you're making, and the solvent can determine uh, the reaction outcome to a great extent. The one last uh, alkylation example I wanted to mention was that thioethers can react with alkylating agents as well, making sulfoniums. Now in the case of something like an alkyl iodide, iodide is still a very good nucleophile, so it could just attack at one of those ethyl groups and convert the product back into starting material. And so these don't tend to be very stable. If you had a different counter ion such as tetrafluoroborate, then you might be able to isolate these salts. Now I'd like to assign a couple practice problems as homework. First, uh, propose a synthesis of the following compound. So you'll need one starting material, a uh, reactant, and then conditions if necessary. The second problem I'd like to assign is predict the product of the following reaction. Um, will this reaction form any additional byproducts or side products from further reactivity? And with that, I hope this has been a useful lecture for describing nitrogen and sulfur-based nucleophiles reacting in an SN2 fashion. If you have any questions or comments, please leave them below. I'd be happy to hear any criticism or comments about how you think this series could be done better. And with that, I hope you have a great day. Thank you.